What's going on, everybody? Welcome to the Alex Quest, the show. How's everybody doing out there on this Wednesday, November 29th of 2023 for episode 101? I hope everyone had a good turkey day, um, that everyone was safe. They got to see their families, their friends. Didn't get too crazy on Thanksgiving Eve. Um, I actually saw somebody like stumbling over themselves at like 2.30 outside of a bar on Thanksgiving Eve, and I felt terrible for her, but she's also a degenerate, so that's okay. But before we get going and tell you the fun stuff, like, share, follow, subscribe, rate five stars, Spotify and iTunes, spread this word of mouth and go look for us on social media. Just go search the Alex Cuesta show. You'll find it there. Go give us a follow. So before we jump in, Dave, we had a fun show last week. It was me and you again for episode 100, which mm-hmm. I thought was a really good time. Um, we talked about our new superhero, Javier Malay, which... I mean, met with Bill Clinton is going to. Yeah, well, yeah, we'll see, we'll see, we'll see, we'll see. We'll see. I mean, we'll see. he's a libertarian, so libertarians are not necessarily fully on the right. So, again, all I know is that if I just hear him, he can win me over, right? He could be a socialist. As long as he just keeps screaming afuera at everything, I might still follow him <laughs> because that that's just awesome messaging. So, you know, lie to me, but make me happy, I guess. That's politics. But this week, we have a fantastic show ahead of us. We are always pumped when we have somebody that is vying to be a part of the government and um you know looks like she might be fantastic so this week's guest we have mara macy she is a u.s congressional candidate for the fifth district of florida her spouse is active navy dmed which is defense medical epidemiology database i said that right whistleblower so what's going on mara how are you i'm doing well how are you it's good to see you yeah, I'm doing fantastic. Uh, you know, we're going to have some fun. So we're just pumped. You are the second potential congr- well, congressional candidate that we have had on. We had Derek Evans on a few weeks ago from West Virginia. And, you know, you, you seem like a patriot as well. So I am pumped to talk to you. So first things first, you're running against John Rutherford. He's the incumbent. He's absolutely god awful. He has like a liberty score of like 50 something. Like it's it's worse than most Democrats. He was staunchly against Jim Jordan, which I hate when, you know, all the establishment people that were against Jim, I can't stand. And I'm pumped that you are looking to step up against him. This is tough. He's going to get a ton of money. Uh, what makes you want to run for this seat? So it's uh, funny that you mentioned that because I actually ran against John in the last cycle. However, I had only been in that race for about two and a half months before the primary. And I gathered it was an open primary. So there were there were no Democrat candidates, which made it so that Democrats could vote in our primary and they weren't voting for me. (laughs) Uh, That and that is directly from some Democrats mouths. They called me an extremist, you know, because I actually have conservative values. And they said, I can't believe I'm doing this, but I'm actually going to vote for John Rutherford. And it just shows you where he is on the political spectrum. He is proudly someone who reaches across the aisle and you can't negotiate with terrorists as far as I'm concerned. So uh, that's not likely to be me, but I got into that race because my husband, again, uh, he's a DMED whistleblower now, but back then we were facing the possibility that he was going to be separated from the Navy due to the vaccine mandate, or should I say shop mandate, because it's not a vaccine. And he, at one point, we had considered he might be the one that would end up running because we thought he would have been separated and he wouldn't have gotten his pension until he was 60 if he got a pension at all, depending on how they separated him that whole instance. But that's because he has three years reserve and he has almost on his 20th year active he'll be retiring next october but um when we thought it was him that was going to run i was like okay we can i can support this we can do this but then as soon as the navy got an injunction out of texas so they couldn't kick anyone out and that's when he looked at me and i looked at him and i i knew and he said it's you you're gonna run so i jumped into the race uh raised about twenty three thousand dollars total and still got around the same amount of votes. So dollar for dollar, dollar for vote, 
I should say, uh, a little bit less, actually, because I did have to give some of that money back. It would have been used towards the general. So I probably raised around 19 something that I could use. And I actually saved some of it, too. So uh, I, I did a good job in terms of managing money, which I think is something that Congress is supposed to do. <laughs> And maybe conservatives are supposed to care about. Last time I checked, right? I don't know what you're talking about. No. We're just supposed to throw money around. <laughs> That's what I hear. Print it. Just print yeah, it. Yeah, just print, just print it. it. Mon modern monetary theory. Just believe it, shut up, and do it. Exactly. So it, it was a long road um, of, of what's going to happen next last year. And when we finally decided it was me, I honestly... I, t I promised people, I said, if there's not a better candidate next time, I'll run against John again. And I didn't think that was, I really thought someone else that was a good candidate was going to step into the race. I've been doing a lot behind the scenes, which I really like doing. I enjoy being behind the scenes because you can do a lot of damage behind the scenes too. Oh, yeah. So uh, I didn't think it was going to be me. But when John opened his mouth and said what he said about Jim Jordan and then Matt Gates. He went after Matt Gates, and people were just calling me and texting me and saying, you said you would do it. And I was like, yeah, I did. Hmm. And I will, because the fact of the matter is this problem isn't going to fix itself. So I can't count on John to do it. And I certainly hand count on the establishment to possibly throw in another candidate that they're going to they're going to frame as a grassroots candidate or um you know constitutional conservative whatever whatever they're going to do i bet you it'll be a lawyer i bet you it's someone who's already got deep ties to the florida gop and if you follow the money uh we will see that it'll be the it'll be john rutherford 2.0 that's really what they do they mm -hmm. just replace the old candidate with the same person in a newer form yeah. And, you know, one of the things that's big about running and the decision to run is your family is going to get exposed to a lot, right? When you run, but your husband was already a whistleblower. So the politics, the government was already trying to go after him because regardless of what the whistleblower law is, when you whistleblow on the government, they are going to try and destroy you legally or not. That's they don't, they don't want those things coming out. Look at, you know, Julian Assange, look at um, Edward Snowden, right? Whether you agree with them or not, they were whistleblowers, especially Snowden. You know, Assange is a journalist, but Snowden was a whistleblower in a in a way. So he should have been protected and been allowed to come back, but they're never going to let him do that. So you guys didn't, I guess, didn't have that much of that decision because it was like, we're already out there anyway. So let's just jump in. And like you said, you did it last year. So they were already trying to mudsling. So it's like, I think it's it's great that you're a person of your word, right? A woman of your word. And that goes a long way because a lot of people will say, yeah, I'll do it. I'll do it. And then when push comes to shove, it's like, mm, you know, I did it last time. It kind of, it was tough. Uh, I don't want to do that again, but here you are trying to do it again. So I think that that goes a long way to showing people that support you that they can trust you. They can believe you. And that's really big in politics. I don't think anybody trusts any politicians anymore right now. With good reason. I, I mean, mm -hmm. They don't have a great track record, but that is the one thing that I've always been uh, very consistent about. I, if I say something, I mean it. I don't. If, if I don't follow through on something, it's not intentional. It's either it's either it was impossible to follow through on, mm -hmm. or just a, a miscommunication. I, I'm true to my word. I was raised with integrity. I come from a long line of police officers and good ones, not the corrupt police officers. Mm -hmm. I have history dating back to the Revolutionary War. Um, I'm actually going to be next month officially sworn into DARA, Daughters of the American Revolution. Uh, my roots go deep in this country. My um, my ancestors were Poconokets. They ate Thanksgiving with the pilgrims. So, I mean, I had no idea so the story goes. It that way. <laughs> I, I, I <laughs> learned something new tonight. <laughs> Poconokets, yeah. I mean, you can't so, compare to um, Elizabeth Warren, though. Like, you're you're nowhere near as Native American as she is. You see, she's Cherokee. So even though we're both originally from Massachusetts, she's living in my people's area. So <laughs> I think it's time to go to war. Just like, you know, warring tribe her. I am very much down with that. She is your typical <laughs> Massachusetts liberal. And I was I've never been a liberal. I you can ask people I went to middle school with. I've always been a conservative. So uh 
it, I do get a lot of people that are like, well, you're from Massachusetts or you just uh, you're just pretending to be a Republican. And it's it's like, no, I'm not. And I will admit at one point in Massachusetts, where I originally registered to vote, I was unenrolled, but I was unenrolled because I could see through the garbage back then that that the Republican Party they were just as crappy as the Democrats when it came oh, yeah. to living up to their word. So I um, I was unenrolled because of that way in Massachusetts, you can actually vote for either or. So if I'm unenrolled and I walk into the primary, I still get to vote and I can choose. Do I want the Democrat or do I want the Republican ballot? Mm -hmm. Now, I never asked for a Democrat ballot, but I will say one was sent to me when my husband was stationed in Spain because I was unenrolled. The um, I guess it would be the supervisors of elections or the town hall or whoever sends out the ballots in Massachusetts assumed I wanted a Democrat <laughs> primary ballot. I will tell you, I still have that ballot it was from 2008. I still have it. Actually, yeah, but it was eight. It was eight. Um, Hillary Clinton was on it. And I was like, what is this garbage? I'm not voting <laughs> for these people. So you- it it is. um it is a challenge being from Massachusetts and having to compete with the likes of uh, what's her name? Elizabeth Warren. Yeah. <laughs> Who's going to call her something else, but Oh, that's Pocahontas. Pocahontas. we can call her Pocahontas, <laughs> but uh, you know, I do have to say to everyone out there, if you're doubting that people from the Northeast can be conservatives, David and I are from New Jersey. We're, we're from Jersey. I'm living in New York guys. We exist. If you don't live in a city, you're probably leaning to the right. And that's everywhere. The cities are very left, especially in the Northeast areas, and they're very dense. Hence why a lot of the Northeast goes blue. But if you talk to majority of the people outside of the city, they are leaning to the right. So people in Florida, stop being jerks. Be nice tomorrow. She is a conservative. And don't be mean to people in the Northeast. We don't all suck. But I want to jump into the military because obviously you have a strong connection to the military with your husband being in there. There is a big issue. Now, your husband's looking to retire, and that is going to be another hit to the military because I think outside of Marines and possibly Special Forces, every single bit of recruitment is down and not hitting their marks. Obviously, there's a lot of things going on. They're promoting wokeness. They like drag queens now and the and the shot. What do you see going on with the military problems? Um, you know, How can you break down those things? And if you made it to Congress, what would be something you would try to do in order to get our military back up on its feet. Well, the very first thing we need to do is change the military leadership. Right now, what we have is a bunch of careerists. Mm -hmm. Um, It's been a problem for decades. It's not anything new, but I think that we're really seeing it come, come to a head. And we have to change those people because there is no trust between the people that are enlisted or the junior officers and the people in charge and at the Pentagon. Um, today, earlier today, um, my husband had a video out from a couple of days ago and he got a phone call from his officer in charge, that's his boss where he works, who had a phone call from his commanding officer over at the Naval Hospital. And the video that my husband had put up, she, she directly ordered him to take it down. Um, now, nothing was in that video except for fact. Mm-hmm. And it wasn't just some random facts. It was DOD facts. Mm-hmm. So there was no political opinion. There was no speculation. It was literally, listen, we have problems. We are seeing people vaccine injured, likely mm-hmm. vaccine injured. It's hard to it's hard to say when they won't address it. Nope. That is the problem. They know these problems exist within their own medical epidemiology database. They know that they exist. However, they're not doing anything to address why do they exist. And if they aren't addressing why they exist or or trying to figure it out and saying to people, because there's been a rise in cancers, they should be putting out, if they think something within the military community is causing cancer to rise, they should be putting it out Mm -hmm. everywhere within the military community. Please go get screened for this cancer or that cancer, but they're not. It's the burn pits. Don't we know that? That is the biggest thing. It's the burn pits. Like Biden keeps saying, we don't need to worry about the vaccine. Let's just look up burn pits from Iraq because, you know, that's the only thing causing cancer. You know, That's going to be stuff that you're up against because that's what you're going to hear that it's burn pits. That's the only big issue. Don't Which would be an vaccine. interesting. It would be an interesting point or even possibly 
a true point, a lot of those people have actually already passed. I mean, that was that was a while back mm-hmm. at this yep. point. It was probably at the very beginning of my time being in this community. But these cancers are rising in the past couple of years. And if we are not having a stand down within the military community and wondering how to get to the bottom of it, then that tells me that they already know what the cause is. They're not addressing it because they already know what the cause is. And then they're trying to silence people over it. That's a problem. My husband is genuinely concerned. He knows people within his own command who have gone through things. He's had people come into his office and say, I'm so proud of you. I wish I didn't do it. I wish I I had stuck with you and done what you did. And don't back down. These are people that don't say it to the rest of the command because Mm -hmm. they're afraid of retribution. But at this point, I'm done. Come after me if you have to. Come after him because if there isn't a country here for my children to live in, then it's not nothing is worth it except for Jesus himself. Absolutely. And I feel like, you know, you would be a great ally in the house for someone like a Tommy Tuberville who's doing God's work right now. Just, you know, let's hear everybody individually that you guys want to place for, you know, ranks and commands and things like that. But they put on these giant, you know, groups of we just want to do all 30 of these people upgrade them all. And it doesn't matter what the military record is, what their track record has been. And Senator Tumberville just keeps on going. No, no. Give me individual people because, you know, some of these people, absolutely, they deserve it. But you're pushing people up that have no, you know, reason to go up there. So I think that's also a big problem, right? Because it's so much a should used to be a rubber stamp in the Senate, right? If yep. there's a recommendation for somebody to get a, um, what you call it a promotion senators just rubber stamp it. it doesn't matter if they were been good in the military if they've been bad if it's a corrupt thing if it's a you know uh quid pro quo that's why they're getting it rubber stamp it but you know and i know tuberville's taking a ton of heat but he's been doing great things but having somebody like you in the house at least that would support him on that i think would definitely help yeah it, it would definitely be of assistance and honestly i think one of the biggest problems that we encountered during this whole past two years of trying to get Congress in general to listen to us is that nobody would actually come out and speak for for the military community that was saying, listen, my my command is telling me if I don't get this, I'm going to get separated. We had Marco Rubio come out and say, well, go get it. And now he's trying to pretend that he's on the side of yeah, these people, it's an injustice. No, you're not. You're What you're doing <laughs> is grandstanding. Mm-hmm. What you're doing is what th- they all do it. They all get up there, especially in election years. Oh, yeah. And yeah. granted, Rubio was reelected last year. But they all get up there and they all say, we need to do this, that and the other. And they say all the right things. But when it comes to action, you get nothing. Mm-hmm. And these people did nothing for our community. And now they're all jumping on the train of, well, let's get them reinstated because we're having recruiting problems. No, no. These people don't want to come back to your corrupt Mm -hmm. military. Mm -hmm. You need to fix your leadership before anybody wants to work for you people again. And I think I was listening to Pat Gray Unleashed on the Blaze Network about, you know, a few weeks ago, and they talked about that the military let out a number that they tried to call back. I think it was like 3,000 people or something like that. And I think the number was... Something like that it was something crazy. And only yeah. 13 of them or something like that came back. Yeah. And it's like, why wouldn't why wouldn't they go back into civilian life? Why wouldn't they stay there and not come back to the military when you not only did you kick them out, they were demonized. Quite literally, anyone that did not get the vaccine or the shot, because I haven't called it a vaccine. I've called it an advanced pretreatment. For the most part, it was a pretreatment. It's not an actual vaccine. But we were told you're killing people. You're evil. You're the devil. And I wouldn't want to go back under my commanding officer who has probably chastised me to my face for not doing it. So I do not blame them. And I think that there needs to be more people fighting for it. Now, you're in Florida. Your governor is still Ron DeSantis. He is obviously running for president. He's a military man as well. He's, you know, he served in the military and, you know, his reasoning for serving, I think, is fantastic. You know, he was everything went down in 9-11. He wanted to serve. I give him credit for that. How do you think he would be on the military now? What you know about him and everything like that? Would he be somebody that would be on your side fighting for this stuff? I mean, I can say at the very least he would grandstand about it, but that that doesn't get us anywhere. That doesn't get us anywhere. I, I know that my husband has personally reached out to our Surgeon General. He has my husband's phone number. My husband mm-hmm. said, I can get all the military people you want to come out and help you with this. They claimed they were going to do, um, what was it, a grand jury? Um, 
and, and, and look into all this stuff and they've done nothing. So honestly, I think you really have to, and I'm going to say this again, I'm sure, but you have to follow the money and watch the ties. Anybody sold can be sold for the right amount of money if Mm -hmm. they're interested in money. Now, not everybody is interested in money, but I'll say most people are interested in money. I'm not one of them. I grew up in a wealthy town and I've seen that it doesn't really do much to make somebody happy. I was happy with my private life. I was happy not being plastered all over the place. I would rather just live my life the way it is, raise my children, but money does a lot for a lot of people. You have to be careful. So I, I, to answer your question, I've seen some of his connections. I've seen some of the political things that have gone down in Florida, and it's not all roses. And you would think, you know, the great free state of Florida or somewhere like Texas or somewhere like, you know, South Carolina, where we hear all these people, you know, North Dakota. Somebody would want to hear a whistleblower thing. Some Surgeon General would reach out to your husband and say, hey, what's going on? This is a federal thing. We want to take it up in our state. We have military members from our state that were obviously affected by this. And, you know, this just kind of goes to show what the problem is with the Republican Party and with politicians and with people that are in political seats, because, um, you know, we talked about the lack of trust. We talked about them letting, you know, I I could say for being a conservative, I'm a registered Republican because it gets you where you need to go politically, but I definitely align more conservative. And I could say I dislike most Republicans because they're not good at being conservative. They're not good at they're good at talking, but they don't do much. And you know, I grew up listening to Rush Limbaugh with my dad. David got the outskirts. And that's all you heard from Rush was complaining about how weak and spineless and feckless the Republicans are. You're obviously running under the Republican banner, but you're more of a patriot than you are a Republican. Why should we trust you? to get into Washington, to go into that swamp, to, you know, get all the lobbyists to go in there and hopefully pull a Matt Gates, tell them all to kick rocks and, you know, go in there and continue to fight for not only the people of Florida, but the people of the United States to get the right things done for them. Well, I I never aspired to be a politician. So that's that. Yes. (laughs) As much as I've followed politics for I'm I'm kid you not. When I was in fifth grade, we had this project where it was everybody's parents kind of let everybody know who their connections were. One guy knew the weatherman. Someone else knew the guy who owns the most popular restaurant in town. Mm -hmm. And someone knew a state rep. And we all had to pick someone to go and write a book, like a a fifth grade book about, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I picked the state rep. So (laughs) granted, it was a Democrat. Um, or he was a Democrat. I mean, I don't know though. He might not be a he anymore. It's Massachusetts <laughs> after all. Yeah. Um, but, but that was what interested me. So I've always followed politics because I always wanted to be knowledgeable on it, but I didn't want to actually be the politician. I just wanted to do my civic duty, go vote, participate. And little did I know I wasn't even doing that right. I didn't figure that out until a couple of years ago, you know, right after all this stuff happened and i realized how we keep ending up with the uniparty Mm -hmm. so i knew that if people like me don't step up who will and you know so what risk do you take exposing what the establishment does by like running these quote-unquote grassroots independent candidates we saw blake masters over in arizona i think undergo have that happen to him in the last election where you know ron mcdaniels was obviously complicit and did not give him very much money even though he was a solid candidate And then there was an independent candidate running. And we all know how that went, that they were, you know, on the left, even though they said some things. You run a risk, obviously, being in a, you know, a red state now in Florida. There's obvious risk there calling out the establishment and people who, in the end, you would possibly want to look for support and to possibly get money. So how is that being a full and total outsider? And what type of support have you gotten? Have you gotten any support from any, you know, senators or any uh, congressmen that are outsiders like you trying to get you in there? So to be quite frank, the RPOF, the Republican Party of Florida, is not my biggest fan. They're also not my husband's biggest fan. When we call them out on social media anywhere, we're the only people you will notice they will not even engage with us. They will, they do not want people 
recognizing that we exist mm -hmm. because they understand that we have a pretty big reach in terms of this whole military community. They don't want that to get any bigger because that's a threat to them. So they are not knocking down my door asking me to help them or them to help me. They're not offering me money. Um, and, and frankly, I wouldn't take it. I wouldn't take their money because I know where it comes from. And I know about how it gets tossed around through the packs. I know all the big names of the people that do that uh, pack washing is what some refer to it as. Mm -hmm. And I don't want any of that. It's it's money from developers, from real estate, from insurance companies. If you see what, what's going on in our state with insurance right now, we our insurance rates have gone through the roof. But guess what? They're making some pretty big donations to some RPOF people. So the laws are being written in their favor. And we've had a lot of that, too, here in the state. We've had a lot of laws uh, labeled with misnomers, such as constitutional carry. We don't have constitutional carry. We have permitless carry. But it doesn't matter because they tried to play it off like it was constitutional because it sounds better. You know, that pesky little document, the Constitution, which we were supposed <laughs> to be following, and somehow we veered off that path. We also had a, um, an election integrity bill it labeled election integrity misnomer. Uh, it, it made it more difficult to request an audit. You can be you can be arrested for trying to hound the SOE. Oh, it's and not only that, it's literally they they added in that DeSantis can can run didn't have to resign to run. That that's insanity to me. Mm -hmm. You don't change the laws for your benefit. And they're gonna sit there and go, oh, well, it wasn't him that did it. Come on, guys, you know better. <laughs> yeah, because that was always a question, and I get it. This is his last term. Regardless, he can't run again. So that's probably what they're going to say as well. He can't even run again. So, but yeah, no, that that kind of reeks of corruption, right? That's the type of corruption that people don't want to see. They don't want to see an individual who has higher aspirations. Ah, hedge my bet. I'm still going to hang on here because I can. And I mean, listen, I am. I I honestly don't have a problem with DeSantis. I'm you know I support Trump. I, you know, I'm, I would vote for Trump over DeSantis. But, you know, if DeSantis were to win, I'm obviously going to vote for Ron DeSantis over a Joe Biden, a Michelle Obama, a Gavin Newsom, even though aren't we supposed to be. Is that debate going on with That's DeSantis? 14th, <laughs> December, That's right. 14th of December. December 14th? So yeah. we're going to see because me and David have said here, if DeSantis loses to Gavin Newsom, it's a real nail in the coffin for his campaign because you can't lose to somebody with a terrible state like him. But, you know. I digress there. So in your eyes, you obviously have a lot of you know knowledge that you've come across. Is the way that they keep getting away with it, the way they keep are able to move money around, is that the biggest way that you know the establishment candidates continue to get voted in and continue to continue to you know just do nothing but always get voted in? Is it because they have such a big backing money-wise, or they have the right people with deep pockets supporting them that will help them get votes? How does this keep occurring? So that kind of those work hand in hand. Um, if you take a, a look at PACs, political action committees in Florida, what you're going to find is, say, candidate X gets all sorts of money from these political action committees, uh, max donations, sometimes even all on the same day. And sometimes those PACs are all run by the same people. Uh, so what really is happening there is if um you want to donate $30,000 to them, but you can't because there are caps on how much you can give to a campaign. They'll throw it through the packs. They'll throw it to each other through the packs. So one pack will give it to another pack, and then that pack will give it to the candidate. And those people at the end of their campaign, when they're closing out their committees, their personal campaign committees, they'll have you know, say $20,000 left over. And when you watch what happens with that $20,000, you see it comes full circle because they'll just give it back to one of the PACs that helps them move the money around to begin with. Now, again, the big donors in terms of who's giving money to those PACs tend to be insurers and hospitals and developers, real estate. We have a lot of, uh, um, as does the rest of the country, has a lot of development going up, you know, the smart cities mm -hmm. yep. and the people that are building those, some of them are actually legislators here in uh, in Florida. 
but they're all working together. They all work on teams. So yeah, a lot of it has to do with money. But the real truth is, is it's not about the money as much as it's about us. We have given up our power. Yep. We have refused to actually do our due diligence in figuring out who the right candidate is. What we do is we wait until we get a mailer or a mm -hmm. phone call or a, a text um, campaign asking me, do I know of these candidates in the polls? They'll they'll skew them intentionally. They'll leave out other candidates just so that you think that the race is only between two other candidates. We aren't doing our job. We aren't talking to our neighbors. We aren't talking to our friends or our family. We need to be educating people on listen. If you're hearing about someone on a television ad or you're getting a mailer bashing a candidate and praising another candidate, find out where those who's paying for them. Because once you find out who is paying for those, what you will realize is that these aren't people getting donations from we, the people, the Americans that, that are looking for change in this country. We are complacent in our own demise. Mm -hmm. We're letting the establishment tell us who the race is between. So they'll, they'll expect that if you're a primary voter, all they have to do is throw a bunch of mailers your way and you're going to vote for their guy. You know what? They're right. Unfortunately, they're right. And then by the time the primary is over, you walk into the general election, you're going to have ideologies. You're either going to go left or you're going to go right. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't matter. Like you said, you said, I'm a Trump guy, but I'm going to vote for DeSantis. That's what they're counting on. And mm -hmm. I'm not I'm not trying to, you know, degrade what you're saying or yeah. how you feel. But that's exactly what they're counting on. Obviously, I think we're going to be voting in the primaries. Nobody here isn't voting in the primaries, mm -hmm. I'm sure. Absolutely. But... You will also notice a huge difference in the amount of people that vote, vote for a school board position versus a congressional position. Uh -huh. We need to know who we're putting on the school board. Absolutely. If you don't know who you're voting for, you shouldn't be voting at all. And if you don't know who the school board candidates are, chances are you don't really know much about your actual congressional candidates yep. or your Senate candidates or your state reps. You are either all in or you don't really know what you're doing. So do us all a favor and start knowing what you're doing. Start looking into these people. Go to a city council meeting, go to a school board meeting, because when you see these people and what they're saying and what they're passing, you start to get a feel for, I don't think I like this guy. Even if he is of your own party, mm -hmm. you start mm -hmm. to realize this is where the uniparty starts. It starts at school board, it starts at city council. It's all local. Politics are local and we have to change it from the bottom up. Definitely. 100 percent. I also feel like there's all there's a simple candidate issue as well, because a lot of people that run for any even local office and everything else, you could see the amount of ambition they have is way over the amount they even want to do anything for the people. They just want the money and the, and the, the position when you you might want, especially if you and a bunch of people seem to agree in the same area. Look, you might not want to run. It's a bit regrettable to run. It's a little bit of a hassle. You're going to have to do a lot of things. But unfortunately, if you don't do it, or if someone who has the best speaking arrangement, <laughs> if, if someone who has the best, um, uh, wow, I'm losing my words on this one, but someone who's actually good at being able to communicate with everyone, unlike me, then <laughs> they could run and actually get in what the people of that community really want to get done instead of the guy or the woman who has just the ambition to get in that seat because just ambition alone is usually what leads to people just taking the money and then doing whatever they need to do to stay in that stay in that position that's right and honestly that seems to be what most politicians are now it's mm -hmm. just it's it's um climbing a ladder. Yep. So for instance, there's a, a congressional district here where um, the, the current congressman, he went through all the steps. He just, he just turned out of state Senate last year. Yeah. Two years ago, it was last year. So he won the U.S. congressional district. This guy is just a puppet for the he's run by the yeah. same people that run John yeah. Rutherford, mm -hmm. by the same people that run all of the local candidates. I'm talking these people run people from the local mm -hmm. school board all the way to the federal offices. Yep. And we fall for it every, every time. time. <laughs> yep. So I think one of our biggest problems that I've seen, you know, in my life, the Republicans are Awful, 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 awful at ground game. 
and even you know the patriotic front that you know more of the uh populist nationalist type of republicans that we're seeing that you know i would like to see get in office more still terrible ground game like yeah. and where you have the left they have an incredible ground game. They get the youth enthused. And we're all looking and going, wow, for the next election, we need to get this group instead of going, OK, not the next election, not the election after that or even the third. We want to start winning and really winning big in the fourth, fifth, sixth. So we can continue a generational thing. We're so we're so short sighted as a party where we're so worried about just the next election. You know, the leftists are willing to lose for years and years and years, which they did. Right. They, you know, but they weren't big for a long time. And now they have all the institutions. They have kids in high school being activists all throughout the colleges. They have the military, which I don't think any conservative would have ever thought would have went this left. Right. You would have thought, you know, military people, they're generally right. You might have some leftists in there, but generally they're on the right. Nope. So how do you, you know, as someone who's been involved in this now, how do we get that ground game? How do we convince some of the people that even on our side that are looking at it going, well, this is a demographic we have to reach. It's like, no, we have to start going young, reaching the youth. What? Why? We could do two things at once. I think our biggest issue, we don't do two things at once. We yeah. look at one and we're like, that's where we have to go. But we can't like, we can't sit there and go, okay, let's start a youth movement while focusing on 30 to 40 year old soccer moms. Let's do both. How do, how do we get there? Well, the party isn't run by conservatives. That's what you have to remember. The party is run by rhinos. They're perfectly happy being moderate. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I know people that will tell you, I don't think they really actually care if they get those people's votes. They pretend that they want those people's votes, Mm -hmm. but they don't actually go after them because they don't really care. And they're willing to compromise on seats. They'll say, okay, don't come after us in this district and we'll leave you alone in that district. Mm -hmm. That is a fact. That is a fact. So what you're talking about is Marxist tactics and and somewhat of like a a China 100 year plan. These things all started go after the youth. This started over a century ago. Uh And we're a little bit behind in terms of that. So I think a lot of us who and I homeschooled for, um, let's say, gosh, I home. My oldest is 16 now. He's a Catholic school now. But I homeschooled from the time he was in second grade until he was in I think through sixth grade, maybe seventh grade. And I sent him to, I sent him to public school because he was an artist and it was an art school. And I was like, you want to give it a try? And he's like, yeah. And I was like, okay, what a mistake that was. <laughs> they, he had furries. They had the whole oh, bit. I'm not like, surprised. I'm not yeah. surprised. I mean, art school, what did you, wait, hold on. What did you expect? Art school? <laughs> it's hard when you have a son yes, who's an yes, artist and yes, he's good yes, at what yes, he does. Yes. And you want to give him the opportunity to, to kind of be able to be himself, even mm-hmm. though you know um, what you're probably going to face. Luckily for us, because we are a military family and we move often, we're very, we're very tight we're very tight so he would come home and be like these people are crazy (laughs) he didn't care about making friends he actually made two really good friends at that school Mm -hmm. they moved on to the art high school whereas we pulled our son and and sent him to catholic school uh where he's much happier because he's still friends with his his friends from the other school but he's just there he doesn't have to worry about furries or you know people having tails i i can't i can't even believe it's a thing um No, but But, that stuff isn't happening. If you listen to the mainstream media, no, that's just right-wing conspiracy. That doesn't happen. It's not real. Well, yeah, just like the the books in the school aren't happening. I've seen the books with my own eyes. Like I've I've seen them. They're happening. And then they try to play it off like we're trying to ban To Kill a Mockingbird. I'm like, no, that was Newsom. That was was California. And that was the leftist that banned like Mark Twain and Huck Finn because he dropped some N-bombs at the time. Like that wasn't, that wasn't, maybe it was some religious, but it was a lot of the leftists too. (laughs) <laughs> right. And gone with the wind. They didn't mm-hmm. like the way it portrayed, you know, history because, mm-hmm. gosh, history is uh, it's bad. Well, you can't say antebellum um, anymore. Antebellum is a bad word. Ask Lady Antebellum when they changed their name. Don't you mean Lady I, A? I know. Lady a. No, they, who, who they stole the name from a, a smaller R&B artist and she sued them promptly. <laughs> I hope she uses that name again then. I, I don't no. know exactly what happened, but I know Lady A, Lady Antebellum still putting out music. And when they did it, they did not check. They just, you know, they needed to virtue signal. That was that was the goal there. 
<laughs> it, it's very disappointing. The whole thing is, is it's just disappointing because it's if these people understood how ridiculous they sound when they say, oh, you guys are banning books. First of all, we're not banning books. We just don't want pornography on our second graders library shelf. It's just I, I think maybe if you want to give that to your kid, go ahead and try it. Maybe CPS will come. I don't know. I, I've not tried that personally. I don't plan mm. on it. Uh, but we're not banning the classics we're banning gender queer and and uh the court of mist and fury books and that this, talk this about book is gay. incest and rape <laughs> yeah it's it's not this is not family friendly reading this isn't a good, good night story it's literally is, disgusting the thing is too it, we're not banning them from public libraries we're banning them from school libraries where no one is saying okay this can't be in the public library in a certain section we don't want it in our schools anymore and I don't think that's rather unreasonable to say, hey, it's let's not, get a story like not let's get a story like gender queer, which is honestly about child abuse more than anything. Uh, you know, if anyone that read it, this poor girl, honestly, she was just abused by her parents who were freaking hippies and just let her do what she wants and wear crusty tampons for weeks on end, which is disgusting. But yeah, if anyone Dangerous. doesn't know that yet, yeah. if anybody doesn't know that yet, go take a glimpse at what your kids are being asked to read in like middle school and high school. But yeah, it's and I think that's the thing that's the most ridiculous and the way they portray messaging as well. And another thing we're not good at is messaging. <laughs> yeah, actually, I was just about to touch on that because of something you said. But uh, I, and I feel like this is a good question to ask as well. How do you get people to care and actually stand on their beliefs when they've been so demoralized of caring and standing on beliefs? Because even with Alex, uh, he probably didn't even know it. He unconsciously said it's not unreasonable to say these things. Obviously, it's not unreasonable. Like you didn't need to put that in there. That qualifier is not needed. It's actually the most reasonable thing in the world to say that. So <laughs> you're not the one that's supposed to be on the back foot here. You're the one that's supposed to say, go away. Like, just go away and go be a freak somewhere else. Like, it's that <laughs> simple. So I, but how do you get people to stop being demoralized and and vote for someone who might not say not might not put qualifiers in front of everything might just say what they believe and actually try to do something for people that need something done in their community. Well, honestly, I think that's something that's really positive about me having been a stay at home mom for so long and homeschooling. I don't have a boss. Yeah. I don't have to worry about getting fired from a job. I literally am going to say what I think. And if we don't agree, we don't agree. And if we do agree, that's great. But I'm not answering to anybody. I, I answer to God. And that is going to be my driving force always. Because again, this is what I'm trying to instill in my children. If we don't have a country worth fighting for, then, then we don't have anything. So messaging is back to your messaging point though th that is huge and this is going to take volunteers because i don't have the money that these can't we already went over this i don't have that money i mean people are free to donate me money i can take money from any american citizen and where can they donate it to if you go to my website www Mara Macy for Congress dot com. Uh, there's a donate button right there and you can donate anything. I've gotten a five dollar donation. I'm grateful for that. Anything. Anything is great. But but the thing is, most of the people that are working for my campaign are going to end up getting nothing if I don't get a, a, a ton of donations. And they're all doing it because they all see the dire need we're in to switch things up in this country and in our in our uh, capital. So it's going to take a lot of volunteers to door knock and get the message across because I can knock doors, but I can't knock that many doors. There are a lot of doors in this in, in this county. Uh, it's most of Duval County, which is where it's that's Jacksonville. Yeah, yeah. that's a city. It's yep. the biggest city la land mass wise in the country. And then we have the majority of St. John's County, which is just south of us. So it is going to take a lot of volunteers. I am happily accepting volunteers. Again, I'm happily accepting money. But I'm also happily accepting people on social media who are from anywhere in this in the world even because they can all share my message. They can all mm -hmm. follow me and and retweet or um quote tweet even if you want to say listen, I can't vote for Mara but but this is the type of person we need. I mean, these are these are the things we can do for each other outside of the area. You can't vote for me, but you can still help. Mm -hmm. And it's free. 
Yeah. And, you know, and this is where America First needs to really show its colors, right? Because you can yell America First all you want. You can make, you know, your little videos or anything. But if you're not willing to go out there, get home from work, kiss your wife or your husband, kiss your kids and go, I got to go for a little bit. I got to be out for a few hours. I got to go help get a candidate that I want in, even if it, I go knock on 20 doors that day. That's 20 doors that somebody else didn't need to knock on. And it matters if you can only go give an hour to a campaign a week. That hour is somebody that that is now filled that they don't have to do. So don't think that just because you're busy and you can't give a lot of time, anytime you can give to these campaigns, go sit in their campaign, campaign office for an hour and call people. That matters. Those types of things matter. And if America First really wants to be a real thing, We need people to step up and do that. And this is also to college kids. Don't just make videos about you standing up in college being a good, strong conservative or populist. If you're a part of a young Republicans group or a college Republicans group, find candidates that you guys want to help. Be useful. Don't just sit there and try and be strong on a leftist campus. Go into your communities that you are in for school and go help. This is the way we win. It's not winning by saying they're going, well, somebody else will do it. That's always been a Republican thing. I'm working. I'm tired. Somebody else will do it. And that person that's going to do it is you. You need to get off your ass. And this is kind of me calling out this whole movement, because if we can't rally around our candidates, then it's not a movement. It is just you saying things. Uh, You know, the difference between the leftists and the people on the right and the populace right now is leftists will go out in droves. They will go. And I know a bunch of them are paid by activists. I get it. It's hard. We don't do that on the right, but we do have majority of the people in this country. I am fully on board saying that majority of these people in this country are conservative, even even with the cities included. If we had half of them give time every single week to help candidates that they want, we will landslide people. And that is what we need. And we need that from our, we need good patriots in Florida where Florida step up. You guys are supposed to be this bastion of freedom right now. You're super red. You're this step up. Let's get Mara in office. And that is me calling them out for you, Mara. (laughs) Well, I appreciate that. It's definitely needed. And it's needed all across the state, all across the country. Uh, We, I just can't emphasize enough how much trouble we're in, especially with the situation with our military, um, with the the recruiting problems, Mm -hmm. with the inability to retain people, and with the poor leadership. Because we are being invaded as we speak. Our border is wide open and that's not just wide open to refugees. It's wide open to terrorists. Yep. It's wide open to everyone. I mean, I thought about flying over there and coming back in speaking Spanish so that I can get a free cell mm-hmm. phone and like <laughs> free housing and stuff too. But, uh, <laughs> you know, I, then I, then I figured it wasn't really, that's kind of a moral probably shouldn't do it. Uh, you should but, do it as a stunt, though, and see if it works. Honestly, you should do it. You want to get some nationals? Do that as a stunt. Get it. Get it all. And then be like, I hate this government. Like <laughs> That would be amazing. <laughs> it would. Maybe we should find someone to do it. But David, I actually you're on. do. I, I am planning on visit, visiting the border um, with a friend, uh, Doc Pete Chambers. He was a, in the military for a while. He, he does a lot of that border stuff. And... Uh, Anybody who doesn't follow Pete Chambers should follow Pete Chambers. He's a great guy. Uh, Another good friend of mine, uh, another Massachusetts native, Mark Bashaw, who was the first court-martialed military. He was was one of the whistleblowers initially for DMED, but he was court-martialed because he wouldn't take the shot. He wouldn't wear the mask and he wouldn't take the test, all of which are emergency use authorization. He was prosecuted at the court-martial uh, found guilty of all charges, although the judge recommended no punishment. However, um, he was eventually separated after 17 years of honorable service. Terrible. He is a he was a medical officer, so he was doing his job. He was doing his actual job, and uh, ironically, uh, the prosecutor for that case was Yevgeny Vindman. Uh, of Alex and Yevgeny Vindman brothers, no <laughs> and he bragged about prosecuting Mark. And right now, um, there's some traders. pretty good. They're the Cabbage Patch Twins, I like to call them. <laughs> um, so they, uh, Yevgeny is actually in. Our, he just entered the race for Virginia Seventh uh, District of Congress. And my friend Cameron Hamilton, who is um, a former Navy SEAL, is running in that race. And Cameron 
is is clearly the better choice. But I take that raise very personally because Mark is a good friend of mine. And what happened to him was unjust. And that man, Yevgeny, was actually bragging about it and calls himself. He thinks he's honorable. He thinks he's a hero. He is partially responsible for the decimation of our military. If Donald Trump doesn't come out and have Alexander Vidman arrested the moment he gets back in office, <laughs> there is no vindication because that man is an absolute traitor. He is a terrible both. human. Yeah, both. Both but of least, them. But at least, you know, Alex Alex has been, he's paraded. He came out. I don't know who the whistleblower is. The man's full of shit. And, he, you know, I hate that guy. He's, he's, I, that, by the way, his name does not represent all Alex's. I do not suck <laughs> like he does. But I don't um, know. So you, you be quiet over there. But uh, so I realized... I don't think we touched on exactly what your husband whistleblowed in the military early on. We talked about it. What exactly did your husband whistleblow on? And, how, you know, say as much as you could say about it. I, I obviously don't want to get anybody in trouble. But, yeah, what exactly did he whistleblow on? So DMED, uh, Defense Medical Epidemiology Database, is the VAERS of of the the defense department of defense it records active duty icd codes essentially so you can't people will argue i'm sure you've heard this one oh people can just go in and log in their own stuff into vares mm -hmm. therefore vares is unreliable even though vares just like dmed is a system that was put into place so that we could see with the red flags happening within our our uh, communities well, DMED doesn't work the way VAERS does. You can't just go in and, and input something. Only the medical system can do it. So anything in DMED has been put into DMED by a doctor, or by the medical system. So it, it's not altered. You can't change it. So what happened initially when Mark Bashaw and, and Lieutenant Colonel Long and uh, that, that set of whistleblowers did the DMED whistleblowing last year, they came back and they said, okay, there is a... Uh, what they what they had found was that there were the increases in heart issues, things like that. And the the Department of Defense came back and said, oh, well, we found a glitch in the system. We're going to fix it. So they fixed it. Yeah. And so my husband decided he was going to go back in and check it because if it's fixed, it's fixed. So let's let's give these let's give it a, a little look and see what's going on. I suggested that he also look up things that would not be immediately associated with what we think just to compare. And yeah. it was all just to compare. Initially, mm -hmm. I was like, let's see, you know, put in something like y y just something random, like an uh, eye problems or, you know, more elaborate than that, but just something random that you don't initially think would be caused by uh, an adverse reaction. So he went in and he looked up all these things, all the all the stuff like myocarditis, those things also still raised. They still went up after the fix, after the glitch was was fixed. Mm -hmm. um, but also we saw an increase in percentage. And I mean, some in the hundreds of things like slips, trips and falls, boating accidents, um, domestic abuse, things that. Wow. And we don't have answers. I want to be clear. We don't have answers. We're not sitting here saying okay, well, these things are all caused by this shot. We don't know what they're caused by. That's why we think they should be looking for an answer. Why aren't they looking for an answer? Why are they just saying, okay, well, this seems okay, even though it's up hundreds of percent. Cancers are up, um, heart issues, heart disease. <laughs> even on Twitter earlier, some guy was like questioning my husband, oh, who is this naval officer? Put it in quotes, like <laughs> like he's not really a naval officer. <laughs> These fake DMED numbers. I mean, sir, those came right out of the computer that he's sitting in front of in his medical office. <laughs> like he's not just making up numbers. But it, it's funny how people will discredit anything based on what they want to believe, whatever fits their agenda. It's, yeah. it's the uh, cognizant dissonance of them. Yeah. And it, it's outstanding because these numbers have gone up. So what he has been doing is comparing the last five years average um, to the past couple of years or the last year in particular, 2022, to see what the increase was. And and it is astounding, some of them, I, even adrenal issues, it's right, down, right down to boating accidents. I mean, come on. Yeah. I mean, you know, that's the thing. Like, 
it doesn't seem like you guys are necessarily accusing like the shot cause this, but it's like, hey, this is that's the X factor right now. We made people take a boatload of this, um, you know, experimental emergency use authorized, you know, a shot. And now things are rising. So is it a cause and effect? Is it a blip? We should be finding that out. That is something that, you know, people in the military deserve to know if there is something more going on right now. And it's but again, this is something that we will find out in 20, 25 years and they'll go, oops, sorry, guys, because that's basically what our government does. Yeah. And Unfortunately, if- I think we're going to find out a lot sooner than that because the the effects Mm-hmm. are very detrimental. And like you said, we are not sitting here trying to say it is a cause and effect of the shots. However, their lack of action and their lack of looking into the matter only leads us to believe that that's they already know what it is. When you're not giving people answers, they make their own conclusions based off the facts that they have. That's just mm-hmm. how it works. Good, Dave. Sorry, I keep interrupting. Yeah, no, it's fine. I was going to say, and even like, because you said, you know, it's not taking voting accidents and everything. But the fact of the matter is, is that you are siphoning recruitment. <laughs> like it's getting so bad that you're putting commercials out with white guys now. Like <laughs> it, 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 so, you guys are just losing on every front, and yet everything goes up, and you won't look into like any of it. Like that's it's weird, and it deserves to be called out, and it deserves to be saying like, "Look, I just think you're lying about this." Even if you're even if you're wrong with that accusation, screw them because you're hiding everything and you're not looking into anything. So military, real quick, I have a pitch for you. Take the scene from Ace Ventura where they start screaming about White Devil and use that as your <laughs> recruitment. I think that would be hilarious. If they're like, ah, that's White Devil. Like that would be like, at least you guys would be honest, right? Get the White Devils back. Let's do this. Like you'd be being honest with how you feel. But yeah, no, that's uh, that's pretty ridiculous. So I want to jump to this last thing. Um, you know, I don't want to hold you too much longer, Mara, but you know, I think this is fantastic right now. You mentioned how you don't negotiate with terrorists. So reaching across the aisle would be something that you're not going to do as often. Now, I think it's ridiculous that most people are like, we want people that reach across the aisle. And then when you look about it, it's like, yeah, Republicans reach, Republicans give in, and then Democrats just get more what they want. There's a reason why we oh, we have continually gone left and left and left and left as we've gone on, mm-hmm. because the 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 leftists never give in. They just take less of something. So it's not that they give anything in. They're never giving up things. Is there anybody right now, if you walked into Congress, that you maybe would say you're willing to work on? Because I know, you know, Matt Gates is famous. He will work with the squad on some things because they're more populist on some things. Or uh, Ro Khanna, he had that one bill that he wanted to go out. And Gates is like, listen, I'll resign from Congress if we just do this with term limits and certain things on it. Is there anybody you see right now that if you walked in there that on the left that you could be like, we maybe have some common ground here. Let's work here. No, (laughs) I don't have people on the right. I love that. I I love that. I love it. That's a great answer. I love it. You know, and that's people need that. People need bluntness and the power of no. We've talked about this before, Mm -hmm. Dave. The power of no and just saying no has been lost. So speaking of the right, there's huge division on the right as well. And A lot of people say it's a weakness. We need to get it together. I think it's a good thing. I think we need strong people on the right to continue to expose your rhinos, your Kevin McCarthy's, your Steve Scalise, who Steve Scalise, it is unfortunate that he was shot by a Bernie supporter, but that does not excuse that he is not a good conservative in Congress. Like he gets a lot of sympathy. And again, nobody wants anybody getting shot. I don't want the leftists getting shot, but that doesn't excuse that he's a terrible congressman. And, you know, so I don't care about that. I'm happy you survived. I know he's not doing great right now. I think he has to have a freaking bag all the time with him. But doesn't excuse that your voting record is terrible. So uh, what would you would you go in there like a barnstormer and basically be like, I'm not siding with any of you. I'm siding with the very few and that's it. And let's go. Let's do some popular stuff here. I I side with the constituents, the voters. That's it. I like that 100%. That That is fantastic. So what do you think about the division right now? Do you think it's healthy for the party to be as divided as we are? Do you think it's um, going to cause a lot of strife and it's something we should now go back on? Like, what, what do you think about that? I believe it's growing pains. If we want to 
come out a butterfly, we have to go through that metamorphosis. And I, I know that a lot of people are very upset that they're embarrassed. People are embarrassed that the party is doing this. And I have to remind them, at the end of the day, in 100 years, nobody's going to look back on you, Joe Schmo, and say your party was so embarrassing. They're not even going to know who you are. Get over it. Yep. Take a stand. You have to stand for something. Take a stand. And right now, we are the only ones that have critical thinkers. You, Like you said, the left will stick yeah. to you. They'll band together, minus sometimes the squad. But they will band together. And by the way, from what I understand, some of the old school Democrats don't really like them at all, mm -hmm. regardless of, of the great attention they bring to the Democrats. But we need this. We need to to change the way things are because people are just so afraid. There's we stop fearing things because we need if we don't change them now, we're just going to go into a slower spiral down. You got to crash and burn and rebuild it because the fact is that that's where we're headed no matter which way we do it. Yep. We either do it fast and start building again or we let it go slower and let our children and grandchildren suffer the consequences, if we even have a nation by then, because God knows that we could end up Venezuela with money that's worth nothing. 100%. And a globalist economy at this point. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Definitely see that. Yeah. And I, I do wonder about the thought towards division, whether, you know, whether you're saying, oh, our country's so divided, oh, or the right's so divided and stuff like that, because... I just feel like there's a mindset towards division where it's just inherently bad that you're divided when, I mean, people just divide themselves naturally anyway in their life. <laughs> no, it, it's a thing that just happens. It's going to happen every, anyway. Like the the left is so damn lockstep that they're lockstep towards damn goose stepping. Like, like that's what they're going towards. It's bad. So why would we want to exactly be that? If it's going to bring us to maybe an extreme that we don't want to see, I would much rather have people be like, no, this is what I think. And, you know, I don't like what you think necessarily. So we're going to have it out until one of us wins. Well, and we have to remember that our founding fathers, they went into a room. Yeah, and and they time. argued <laughs> yeah. for days and, yeah. and they argued and argued and argued. And when they came out, you, they said we have an agreement and between the federalists and the yeah. anti-federalists that's we all know the story that's how we ended up with our bill of rights yep but the the thing that we have to remember is they didn't get along they weren't best they friends they weren't happy yeah <laughs> but they still did it yep. for the betterment of this country and of its future so when we hear when i hear conservatives say well i'm really embarrassed and, and I, I wish that they didn't do this because it makes us look foolish. You know what makes us look foolish? Continuing to vote for the uniparty establishment machine and a side with the left half the time and say we have to, oh, no, we have to come around to this because we're going to lose based on that. No, I will not give up my moral principles. I cannot tell you that I need to not talk about abortion because people don't like it. I can't not speak abortion because it's wrong. You don't just pretend it doesn't exist. So we need to understand that the right is made up of critical thinkers. And that's why we don't get along. Don't just let someone else tell us what to believe. We have our own morals and our own principles, and we push for those. And we should continue pushing for those. 100%. And, you know, and I think that you're somebody that when you get in there, I think you're going to beat John Rutherford because John Rutherford's kind of a breadstick too. So you have a personality that helps. Um, <laughs> I think you're going to, you know, I think you're going to be John Rutherford. I think that you're going to represent the state of Florida and the American people very well. And I absolutely really appreciate the fact that you decided to come on this podcast. Thank mm -hmm. you so much, Mara. Thank you guys for having me. It was a great time. Yeah, it was amazing. Once again, she is Mara Macy. She is Wait, running for Congress. No. Oh, good. Dave. I forgot my non sequitur. Oh, question. do your non sequitur. You go almost ahead. Ran Dave. us off. Oh, go you ahead. Do it. Ran do it. You need your non sequitur. My segment. Yes, yes. <laughs> but it's around Christmas time. It's damn near it. it. Turkey Day's over, so we could actually ask questions about it now. Do you like Christian music? God, not not Christmas music. One, two. If you do like it, what's your favorite song? Oh wow! So I love Christmas music. Okay, because I know but some let me be clear. <laughs> no, there's something wrong with everybody. Everybody has a flaw. <laughs> my favorite, my favorite Christmas song is "Oh Holy Night." Um, as soon as it plays the first time, 
every year I cry automatically, um, especially particularly, I should say, in the part where she or he, depending on who sings it, even though I will say I'm partial to the Celine Dion version, Mm -hmm. only for that song, though. I'm not a huge Celine fan. I just like that version of that song. But when she says, um, long lay the world in sin and error pining till he appeared and the soul felt its worth. I'm getting goosebumps right now. So I will tell you this. I do not like Christmas music. That is not really about Jesus. I like right. Jesus Christmas music. So right. not into like Jingle Bell Rock. I'll mm-hmm. sing it. I'll, you know, yeah. dance with my yeah, kids. With vibe, yeah. <laughs> it ain't my jam. Yeah. As oh, long holy as, night. As long as it's not Mariah Carey or Last Christmas by Wham, the two worst <laughs> songs. The no. worst Christmas songs by far. That Wham song. And Wham was a great band. Wham is fine. I like that, George Michael. George Michael was. But a, that song is horrible. Honestly, stop giving your heart away every year, you small child. Every year. Every year. And I, I think yeah. Ariana Grande just did one similar too. And it's like, I understand Ariana Grande is with everyone in Hollywood. So whatever. I get it. She's probably actually doing that. But yeah, no, I hate that song. And it, it's a bad thing that Wham saying it. So generally, I like Wham. So yeah. Wham's great. Not and, that song. And I, you know, I will be remiss to not mention Oh Holy Night, the Eric Cartman version. Not as oh, good as yeah. the Celine Dion version, but still <laughs> I, worth I did, giving I, a listen. I, I did, close I second. Did get that it's in a my close head for second. A second. Yeah. yeah, when he's getting when he's getting zapped for not singing it right. <laughs> oh man. I don't know what you're talking about. I've never seen South Park. I mean, <laughs> oh, yeah. uh, whatever show that's from. Yeah, no, South Park, or, you know, don't go see Book of Mormon, which is hilarious. Anyway. <laughs> sorry, I did the Joe Biden whisper. I'm sorry, everybody. But anyway. David, thank you for your non sequitur. No Always problem. appreciated. No so once again, Dave, do you have anything else to say before we jump out of here? No, I have nothing else to say. Actually, ever. I'm probably just going to go mute at this point. I mean, that's fine. That would actually benefit the show. Anyway, once again, Mara Macy, she is running for United States Congress out of Florida District 5, running against the incumbent, John Rutherford. Um, please do everything you can to unseat him. He's awful. He's against Jim Jordan. He is a uniparty member. He would much rather watch a Democrat win than Mara. So... Please, you know, go help her out however you can. Um, She is the spouse of an active duty Navy defense medical epidemiology database whistleblower. And again, where can people go donate? What website can they go on? www.maramacyforcongress.com. You can follow me on X is where I am normally at Mara Macy, M-A-R-A-M-A-C-I-E. I can sometimes be found on Facebook, but usually I'm just posting the stuff from X and um, Twitter Truth, uh, Getter, all have the same handle. So you're going to get the same content no matter where you go, but go to X. Perfect. Perfect. And once again, this is the Alex Cuesta Show. If you like what you heard, like, share, follow, subscribe, rate five stars on Spotify and iTunes. Spread this word of mouth. Go look for us on the socials. We are everywhere. Just go except for threads because threads is useless. Uh, The Alex Cuesta Show. Um, Just go search for us there. We will be back again. We have another great show ahead. Everybody, thank you so much for listening. So long, y'all.